So Luke chapter 17, we're going to be in verses 20 to 37. And if you know anything about Luke 17, 20 through 37, um, it's a scripture about end times. It's a scripture about Jesus coming back. It's a scripture about the kingdom, God's kingdom that is coming. And when we study scriptures on the return of Christ, when we study scriptures on the kingdom of God, it solidifies your faith. It really encourages your faith. And I remember in seminary, the last seminary class I took was Theology 4, taught by Dr. Larry Pettigrew, and it was about eschatology, and that's the study of last things, the second coming of Christ. And honestly, the reason it was my last class is because I didn't want to take that class. I put it off to the end. And the reason I struggled with taking a class on eschatology was because I kind of thought, what's the point? It seems kind of futile to me that you have really smart people that have disagreements about how things are going to end. And if you've been in church for uh, more than six months, you probably realize there's different views on the end times and on Christ's return. And so um, I didn't want to take the class. I didn't want to get in fruitless arguments. I just felt like, what are we doing, you know? But I was forced to take the class to get my master's in divinity degree, and I found it to be very helpful. And I would say it was like glue or cement to my faith that really brought a lot of things together that really helped me. All doctrines, all teaching about Christ, it all culminates in the end. All the things that you study about the church and the Lord and the Holy Spirit, everything culminates somewhere. And even this past week when I began to read Luke 17, when I, I'm like, okay, what's the text for this week? And on Monday, I usually start reading the text and get familiar with it. I'm like, oh, more end times. I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to be difficult. That was like the first thing that came to my mind. This is going to be challenging. Okay, Lord, help me, you know. That was just how I began the study. But after I studied this text and spent a lot of time on it, there, I have a, a, new, uh, a renewed passion to preach and teach. And the reason for that is because we live in a volatile world. And we know how it will end as believers. And so we don't live in fear of World War III we don't live in fear of nuclear bombs. We don't live in fear of global warming because we know how it's gonna end. God tells us how it's gonna end and God is in control. And so while we live in this world that's full of fear and pumped fear into us all the time, we don't have to be afraid because we know God and we know how this is gonna all end. God is in control. One of the things that was convicting this week is as I studied the passages on the kingdom of God, I noticed that Christ teaching the gospel was connected to the kingdom of God. And the apostles, when the apostles preached the gospel, it was connected to the kingdom of God. And so in my preaching and teaching, I love to preach the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation, but I don't often preach it with the kingdom of God. And so I just want to show you some passages to help you see that and help you in your own thinking about the kingdom and the gospel. So in Luke 4.43, Jesus, as he began his ministry, said this. He said um, in 4.43, He said, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Christ was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then in the book of Acts, you know, after Christ was 
died and raised again, in the book of Acts, it begins this way. This is the start of the church. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says... To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And then if you look at Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. So Philip was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. And then when we look at Paul's example in Acts 19, is what it says of Paul. Acts 19, verse 8. He entered the synagogue for three months. He spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. And now behold, I know that none of you, this is Paul preaching, among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. That was his instruction to the elders. And then at the end of Acts, chapter 28, verse 23, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him as his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, this is the Apostle Paul, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And then this is how the book of Acts ends. Verse 30, Acts 28, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So, I was forced to ask myself then if the kingdom of God was such a focal point for the teaching of Christ and for the teaching of Philip and for the teaching of Peter and for the teaching of the Apostle Paul, why isn't it a focal point of our teaching? Why isn't it a focal point of my teaching? Why isn't, and I, I, I don't want to just single myself out here, but as I, I do a lot of research online and listen to a lot of messages online from a lot of really good preachers and teachers, And it's not the focal point of people's preaching and teaching, the kingdom of God. So then what happened? I'm going to give you four reasons. I had to really think through this. Why don't we teach more on the kingdom of God? And let me give you four reasons that I can think of. This is extra credit. First reason is power. First reason is power. Americans are a people who oppose a king. We as a people don't want a king. We don't want tyranny. We don't want a dictatorship. That's why we became a nation. We got away from the kings. And the reason Canada became a nation, I was in Canada for the 150th celebration of their country. And I went around to Canadians and said, why are you a country? How did you become a country? And nobody knew. It was fascinating. So I had to study it more. The reason Canada became a country is because they wanted to stay under the king. They wanted to have a monarchy. They wanted the, they wanted the comfort of government. They wanted the comfort of military. They weren't ready to just do their thing and join the Americans after the revolution. So. We're a people that doesn't want a king, and yet Christ is king. And he has a kingdom. And part of our struggle in not wanting a king is because we know absolute power corrupts absolutely. We know that through history. So we want a checks, we want a government with checks and balances. 
So the first reason I don't think we talk about the kingdom and the king is because, just being Americans, we don't want a king. Secondly, time. Time. It's been a long time since Jesus was here. The creation has waited 2,000 years for the imminent return of Christ. The Christian message, 20 years after Christ died and was raised, 20 years after that, the Christian message was received as foolish. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is setting up his kingdom. He came first to die for our sins. He's coming back. In 20 years, they're like, this is foolish. You guys are crazy. So now it's been 2,000 years. If you want to lose your credibility with an intellectual, tell them with confidence that Christ is coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom. And they will put you in a box that says cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. (laughs) And they'll throw away the key. They'll think you're a conspiracy theorist. So it's been a long time. People think we're crazy. Third reason I think we struggle preaching on the kingdom is goodness, goodness. Why long for a kingdom that is good when we have it so good living in Sonoma County? We have all the best things in the world within a 100 mile radius. You could walk to some of the best wineries in the world. You can walk to the best brewery in the world living in Windsor. You can walk to the most well-known celebrity chef in the world, lives in Windsor. The best rock band, Metallica, is from Marin County. And if you say, no, Green Day is the best rock band, well, they're from the East Bay. We have the best well-known cult leader, Jim Jones, from Redwood Valley. The best computers in the world, Apple, 100 miles away, Silicon Valley. You want the best seafood in the world, go that way. You want the best cheese in the world, go that way. You want some of the best duck and poultry in the world, go that way. And if you want some of the best wacky tobacco in the world, go that way. It is what it is. I have another name for that stuff, but that's my mom's name and for it, and we'll stick with that. So in our text, in Luke 7, 17, right, when Jesus says, and we'll get to this, but let me just point your attention here to start with, Luke 17, verse 31, When Jesus says, on that day, let the one who is on his housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away, likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. She turned back. She looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Verse 33, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Lot's wife couldn't stand, as God was judging Sodom and Gomorrah, she could not stand that her city was being engulfed in flames. She longed for that city. She did not want to leave it. Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back 
is fit for the kingdom of God. What's to come has to be better than what's here. And what's here is really good. So that's the fourth word then, is better. God's kingdom is better. And we don't know how much better his kingdom is. In Romans 14, there's these Christians squabbling about minor things. And Paul gives them some instructions to help them deal with these minor things. And he says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's not what the kingdom is about. That's not the focal point of the kingdom, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we think joy comes from eating and drinking, but in reality, the joy comes from righteousness and the Holy Spirit. And that's what the kingdom is about. And it is that. Not will be that, it is that. We get a taste of it now. So if we knew how good the kingdom of God is, we would talk about it more. We would encourage each other more about the kingdom of God. And we would invite others to be a part of the kingdom of God more. But as it is, we struggle with power, the length of time, the goodness of what we have, and is the kingdom really better? So with that as our background for American Christians, let's read Jesus' teaching on the kingdom and preparations for the kingdom in Luke 17, starting in verse 20. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, so unbelievers are interested in the kingdom of God, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there, for the behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Verse 22, he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together at the wheel. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we need your spirit's attendance. We need to have our eyes open to these things to learn what you want us to learn. We're taking on a big subject today that can be confusing, help it not to be confusing. Give us, um, give us your insight into what's to come. Increase our faith, Lord, 
solidify our faith, help those who are here who have yet to put their faith in Christ, that they would do that today as they hear his message on what's to come. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is going to give two lessons on his return in his kingdom. There's a lesson for unbelievers, that's in verses 20 and 21, and then there's a lesson for believers, or lessons for believers in verses 22 to 37. So first of all, the lesson for unbelievers. And the lesson is this. Unbelievers are blind to the kingdom of God. Blindness. There is a lack of sight So notice what Jesus says in verse 20 to the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders. This is is a picture of false religion. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he said to them, so to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is presently in your midst. Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, you guys, when is the kingdom of God going to come? It's here. I'm the king. I'm setting up the kingdom right now. The blind are receiving their sight. The, The people that are sick are being healed. Those who are full of demons, the demons are being cast out. The lepers are being cleansed. The blind are giving sight. The leper or the hungry are are fed. The thirsty are being quenched. Kingdom's right in front of you and you don't see it. So the lesson for unbelievers is you're not able to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. This is the, this is the lesson to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And after studying this further, I have a little bit different idea of John chapter 3. And he said to him in chapter 3, verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus gets right to the point with this guy. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Not Unless one is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. No. Unless one is born again, he cannot, present tense, see the kingdom of God. He's a Pharisee. These Pharisees cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Because they don't believe in Christ. So they don't see it. The Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 4, Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they don't see the glory of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible tells us that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, spiritually dead, no pulse. You have to be born again. Well, then the question is, well, how do you be born again? Jesus says, well, it's a work of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't, you didn't have anything to do with your first birth. You have nothing to do with your second birth. The Holy Spirit has to do the work in your heart to quicken your heart. And then by grace, you put faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Jewish leaders were so blind which is kind of a weird, I probably shouldn't say it that way. You're either blind or you're not. But it was so bad that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, they put a sign over his head that said, King of the Jews. (laughs) And it was customary to put the offense or the, the law that was broken above the person they were crucifying to show what they were being crucified for. And so for Jesus, he was crucified for claiming to be the king of the Jews. They mocked him. (laughs) He is the king. He's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of the world. He's the king of the universe. But that's how blind they were to the glory of this one. 
So Jesus' lesson for unbelievers is this. Seeing isn't believing. Seeing isn't believing. (laughs) Believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. Right? You see, when you believe in Christ, you start seeing a whole lot more. So that's the lesson for the unbeliever. Here's the lessons for the believer, for Christ's disciples, for his followers in verse 22 through 37. I want to give you a quick disclaimer about these 16 verses. This isn't a comprehensive teaching on the end times. It's not a comprehensive teaching on the kingdom of God. If you want a comprehensive teaching on the kingdom of God, you have to study study the book of Jeremiah, the book of Isaiah, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, the book of Joel, the book of Malachi, the book of Psalms. You've got to study Mark 13. You have to study Matthew 24. You have to study 1 Corinthians 15. You have to study Romans chapters 9 through 11. You have to study 2 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2, the book of Jude, 2 Peter chapter 3, and Revelation chapter 4 through 22. And you need to understand the seven bowls, the seven judgments, the seven seals, and the seven plagues. Once you study that, you'll have a really good idea about the kingdom and the second coming. (laughs) And you'll also have four seminary units. And you only have 116 more units to get a master's in divinity. So the reason I share that is because after this sermon, you're going to have what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about. There's 200 what abouts. And what you have to realize in the teaching of Christ is the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. And you have to focus on what's clear and what's given. And you need to live according to that. Start there, okay? Because there's a lot of people that get off into the weeds and they miss the important things. So these are the main things. These are the plain things, okay? This is what Jesus gives us in Luke 17. And there's six features. I'll just give you six highlights or six words about the coming kingdom. The first word is desire, desire. Luke 17, verse 22. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you're not gonna see it. There's gonna be a desire on our part to see Christ. To have Christ with us. Because the world goes from bad to worse. (laughs) Not from bad to better. The Bible's clear. 2 Timothy says that evil men will go from evil to worse. (laughs) It's going to get bad. There's going to be persecution. We're going to want to see Christ. We're going to want to have him with us. We're going to want to have him return. And for these disciples, they had been with Jesus for three years and he's going to go away and they're going to have a strong desire for him to be with them again because of what they're going to have to go through. But he's not going to be there for them in, the, in physical form. So that's the first, is there's going to be a desire, Christian's desire for Christ to be with us physically. The next word is deception, deception. Verse 23, and and they will say to you, look there or look here, do not go out or follow them. Because of the Christian's desire to be with Christ, for Christ to be with us, we then become susceptible 
to schemers and scammers who try to prey on Christians to follow some weird teaching. And it's because of the desire that we have, that we are now susceptible. And this happens all the time in Christianity. People are trying to gain followers, trying to make these predictions, and they prey on the simple-minded, gullible people. There's always false prophets. There's always false messiahs. Talked about Jim Jones, right? A false messiah. David Koresh, false messiah. And they do documentaries on these cults who all have Christianity attached, and that's the weird part. They do these documentaries on them, and I'm fascinated with these documentaries because I'm like, who in the world would follow these people? How are people so gullible to follow these people? So listen, if you're a Christian, Jesus says, do not follow them. Can he make it any more clear? Do not follow them. And he says this in verse 24. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. The return of Christ will be unmistakable. You will know it for sure. Even CNN will talk about it. Okay? It, it will be all over. You will know he's come. It's not a secret. It's not a mystery when Christ comes back. The third feature of the second coming is sequence. Sequence to his coming. Verse 25. But first, proton, first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. There's a sequence. Jesus came the first time... (laughs) to be the suffering servant, Jesus will come a second time to be the conquering king. First coming, second coming, and there's a sequence. And there's also a sequence of events to his second coming as well. Christ's generation didn't want, they didn't want a suffering Messiah. They didn't want this gentle and humble king riding on a little donkey. They didn't want that Messiah. They wanted wanted a king that would destroy and overthrow Rome. (laughs) The Romans were oppressing the Jewish people. They wanted a conquering Messiah. We don't want this Messiah. What they didn't realize is Jesus came to defeat our greatest enemy, and that's Satan and sin on the cross. And so they rejected him. Jesus knew they would reject him. And in 1 Peter 2, it talks about the people rejecting the cornerstone. And that word rejection is a really important word. It's, It's the word to examine something and then to reject something. So when men go to Home Depot or some lumber yard and they pick up two by fours, they want to make sure they're straight and they're plumb and they're going to be used. Or if you want to build foundation, you need really straight. You can't mess around. You want straight Things And so if it's not, you reject it. When, when women go to the supermarket and they look at fruit, they examine the fruit and they say, this is good, this is not good, and they reject it. It's frustrating at Costco. When I go to Costco and try to buy stuff, women are picking through fruit like crazy. And it's like, look, guys, it's cheap. It's all about the same. Just get it. It's, there's always going to be one that's messed up in there. But they're throwing tomatoes all over the place. Anyway, um, So they examined Christ and they rejected Christ. And people still do that today. People still examine Christ and they still reject Christ. Bad move. Fourth feature of his second coming is apathy. Apathy. This is really interesting to me. When the world continues to get bad and worse and Christ is coming... It's going to be business as usual. People are going to still be doing the same things. So he says in verse 26, 
Just as it was written in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage. Nothing wrong with that. Until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Note the all there, both of these judgments, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, all were destroyed. All were destroyed. So these are the two, two of the greatest judgments in the Bible Jesus mentions. So we can learn a lot about Jesus' second coming from what happened with Noah and the flood and what happened with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. In both cases, evil and wickedness was rampant. In both cases, there was a lot of demonic activity. There was darkness. There was sexual immorality. In both cases, there was God-fearing men preaching of judgment, preaching of righteousness. But the people, just like today, are so preoccupied with the normal things of life, the normal business of life, They pay no attention to these preachers of righteousness and of Christ, right? Life is already busy enough. I got to take my kid to the soccer practice. I got to take my kid to school. I got to pick them up here. I got to pay this bill. I almost took a picture of my table right now at home, my dining room table. It's just full of bills. August, for whatever reason, DMV comes after me, Um, the bridge toll people come after me, the insurance companies come after me, the water agency comes after me, the the garbage people come after me. August is just, just rains down. And so I just have all, all these things I'm dealing with. Life is busy. Especially live in California, you gotta do a lot. You gotta keep up with a lot. And, and people thought Noah was nuts because <laughs> he's building a boat. Bro, it hasn't even rained yet. What are you doing? Some people, one person just said, if they tipped this building upside down, it would look like the ark. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> so we're all going to go. Anyway, no. So um, people, people thought Lot was, they thought he was joking when he told them judgment was coming. They thought he was joking. In the seven year tribulation period, where there will be massive bloodshed, people will still be going on as life as usual. I thought this was an interesting quote from this commentary. He said, the Christian message is not for those who think that they deserve a better fate than their neighbors, but for those who, in the midst of universal indifference and complacency, realize the desperateness of their situation and ask, what must I do to be saved? So the Christian sees the mess, they see the problems, and they go, whoa, what's going on? What do I do to be safe and to be saved and to be rescued? The fifth feature of the second coming of Christ will be preparation. Preparation. When he comes again, who is going to be ready? Who is going to be prepared? So in Luke 17... Verse 30 will be on that day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. 
who is prepared. I do think, when you put in 1 Thessalonians 4, I do think that Christ in verses 35, verses 34 and 35 is speaking of the rapture, where when Christ comes, he's going to snatch up believers. And then will come the seven years of tribulation, three and a half years of pretty good peace. Then there'll be the Antichrist, this one who will be supreme power over the world. He'll lead the world into total weirdness and judgment. And at the end of those three and a half years of tribulation, Christ will return. I might be wrong on that. Yeah. And so will that person. Um, But you get what you believe. Just kidding. You don't get what you believe. I believe in the safest out, right? And so I kind of want that to happen. But who will be prepared for the Lord's return? That's the key. Who's going to be ready? Or who is going to seek to preserve their life and lose their life? because they were so committed to this life. Who will be ready for Christ? Who is ready to go? And Jesus is clear here, you have to make up your mind before it happens. When he comes back, it's too late to change your mind. You have to be ready. Is it your desire to preserve your life and live for this world, or is it your desire to die to yourself and live for Christ? Most of us have had to deal with this in Sonoma County. When the fires came, the one where we had to all leave, the Windsor one, what was that one called? Kincaid, okay. On that one, right, you had to leave. It's fire coming, you got to go. And so you, you packed up kind of what you thought was important in life and what you could fit in your car and you left. And you didn't turn back. Or when you get on a plane, the stewardess instructs you in case of an emergency, you know, they tell you where your flotation devices are and they say, hey, make sure you take care of those around you, make sure you take care of your children, Uh, people that can't take care of themselves, look out for them. Don't mess with your baggage. Don't mess with the overhead bins. Get this stuff done and get off the plane. And I would love to talk to somebody who is a stewardess or a flight person that would say, you wouldn't believe what people try to get in an emergency. They're probably digging through their bags trying to get the book or something. It's like, get off, go. Don't look back. Some people think this might be referring to when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, 1.1 million Jews were killed in that destruction of Jerusalem. And Christians received the teaching of Christ and they fled. And they didn't look back. And many Christians were saved in that AD 70 destruction. The sixth feature, then, of the second coming of Christ is death. So you have desire, desire, deception, sequence, apathy, preparation, and death. So verse 37, and they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Thanks, Lord, for being so clear. That settles it. My mind is at ease now. I can go to bed, you know, whatever. Again, kind of interesting teaching from Jesus. Where the vultures are, there the cor- corpse will be. You want to know where dead things are? Where dead animals are? Just see where the vultures are, right? You want to see where these things are? There's just going to be a lot of death, and there's going to be a lot of vultures. Because when Christ comes back, it's not just to restore his kingdom, but it's to judge the world. And there's going to be a lot of judgment. There's going to be a lot of death. More than 37 million people died at the end of World War I. More than 62 million people died at the end of World War II. 62 million people died. 
And despite the horrors of those numbers, they're small in comparison to the billions that will die at the end of the tribulation, at the return of Christ. In your notes there, I gave you a couple verses. I didn't really want to end there. I thought, ugh. So Hebrews eleven seven. Thinking about Noah, right? By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Noah became a righteous man by faith. It also says when Noah preached, he had the spirit of Christ. And so he was preaching righteousness by faith. You need to repent of this wickedness. You need to believe on Christ. You need to believe on the Lord and be saved. 2 Peter 2.4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed to them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, that was his family, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. You can go where Sodom and Gomorrah was, Today, it's on the east side of the Dead Sea, and it's not there. It's extinct. And if he rescued righteous Lot, listen to this, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. It was so hard for Lot to live in Sodom. He knew what was going on. Sodomy was so bad. It tormented him how bad it was. Day after day. But he stayed there. Verse 9, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lusts of defiling passion and despise authority. I thought it was just such a good like, confidence for us, if you know the Lord, to trust that God has all of this in control. And even though it's hard to live sometimes in the days we're living in, God is in control. And as a preacher of Christ, I need to tell you, you have to repent and believe on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This judgment is coming. This judgment is real, and you have to repent. You have to believe on Christ, okay? Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for a time to think about what's to come. We thank you for the second coming of Christ. We pray, Lord, that it would come quickly. We pray that you would set up your kingdom here on earth and that we could enjoy just the the beauty of your kingdom and righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, continue to watch over us and keep us in the days we're living in. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be salt and light as we look forward to your return. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.